We should start the uh, uh, tonight's proceedings. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Professor Robert Sang. I'm the acting Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, Griffith Sciences um, of the Griffith Sciences Group. Um, welcome tonight to our Griffith Sciences Impact Lecture, uh, the first genomic study of Aboriginal Australia. Um, and this evening's event comes on the back of a very important piece of research which was published uh, on the same title in the prestigious Nature, uh, journal Nature uh, only two weeks ago on the 21st of September. Now, uh, before I commence the uh, proceedings, I would actually like to ask Colleen Wall to provide an acknowledgement to country. Um, for those of you that don't know, Colleen was also an author on this um, publication. Oh, you got it. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Thank you. Is that working? I pressed the right button. Okay, I apologise that you've got me instead of Uncle Bob, our esteemed elder. Um, Uncle Bob um, has mentored me for the last 25 years um, that I've been living here in Brisbane. Can I, can I just put that there? Yeah, of course. Is that loud enough? What? Is that microphone working? Just try now. That's okay. I'm just trying to get the paper closer to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank my colleagues for the opportunity tonight to do this important job. Juka, our Aboriginal land law, requires lawful behaviour on country. So as a senior Dawakabi woman, I must always, as a visitor, pay respects to the ancestors of the country where I intend to publicly speak. On behalf of the Gin, Dun and Jarjams, women, men and young ones here with us now or may come later to this talking circle, I pay respects to the following spiritual ancestors of the Turrbal Yuruppal peoples. This is my Juka, land law. I must greet them saying Dimbal and Gari, thus informing them that we sit here today only in friendship. <coughs> to fulfil my obligations and responsibilities I must in respect to Yawanari the serious talking and singing grounds in this vicinity acknowledge ancestral beings within a circle of recognition. Acting lawfully within Juka, I must first acknowledge Kutha, the bee of Mount Kutha to the west. Kutha is cousin to my nation's ancestor Kovai, the light bee of the Mary River, and is very important to me as a visitor to this land as it is this ancestor that will recognise my smell and vouch for me on this land. I acknowledge Gumbo, the water mollusk to the north, farmed for thousands of years at Breakfast Creek. This spiritual ancestor relates to the creation story of the Mary River and the, crea the creation of Dulla, the lungfish in my homelands. I acknowledge to the east across the river, Mianchen, the spear tree at Gardens Point, and then Coming back to this side of the river, I acknowledge the burial grounds at Kangaroo Point and beyond that, Wool and Copper, the dispute resolution grounds. Now I acknowledge Kungaiga, the crayfish whose home, just south of us here behind Somerville House, was one of the very large strings of water holes known as the Swirling Waters, which ran from Wool and Copper right through to the Buranda past Prince Ale Princess Alexandra Hospital. In saying that, I must never forget to acknowledge Kung Narvang the water mother of the freshwater dreaming songline that my family holds as a special responsibility that was passed down from my grandmother's grandmother. So I respectfully honour and acknowledge the aquifer springs close to us here, to the north at Spring Hill that runs into the river from Roma Street Parklands, to the east at Mowbray Hill which feeds the Raymond Park and into uh, Wool and Copper water holes. Also here in this space, where the spring from the cliffs beside us fed a small creek that runs beside this building and into the area where the ships docked below us at the Maritime Museum site. This ship in hotel was built on Dock Street. And last but not least, the spring that fed the productive swamps of West End that, feed, that fed all visitors to this area when there were ceremonial practices. Now, only now I can introduce myself as I am a tiny droplet of water in the very large waterhole of life on this land. I'm Colin, Colleen Marin Wall of the Dawa Kavai Nation. Marin or Gwana is my personal marang, the totem, 
Dawa is my Stringybark family clan Murrung, and Dot Kovai, one of the many native bees in my nation's Murrung. I work in the arts and cultural field and spend a lot of my time finding right people to work with on particular projects. I now, as a visiting senior Dawa Kabi woman, humbly ask that these spiritual ancestors that I have acknowledged guide us through our discussions today and keep all our visitors safe while on this country. I also ask that they assist in enabling your safe return home through each respective area that you must travel. Nyara, welcome. Thanks uh, very much for that, Colleen. And, and of course, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon we meet today, um, pay respects to elders past and present, and of course, extend that um, welcome to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, we have some senior um, staff of Griffith Sciences attending tonight, so I'd like to acknowledge um, our Acting Dean Research, Professor Hamish McCallum. Uh, we have also um, the Griffith Environmental Futures Research Institute Director, Professor Shi Hong Shu. Shi Hong, where? Just up the back there, thank you. And also um, our uh, Centre Director, where the research was carried out tonight in the Centre of Human Evolution, Professor Raina Grun, and Raina's on the end there. Uh, and also uh, an ex a special welcome to Honorary Professor Warren Day from our um, Advisory Board of uh, Engineering, Industry Advisory Boards. Thank you very much for coming along. We've also got um, quite a few colleagues from the university, our university, and other universities and research organisations in Queensland, also from the Queensland Government. Just to give you a sample, we've got people here tonight from Monash University, um, James Cook University, University of Queensland, Southern Cross University, QUT, the Queensland Museum, Department of Sciences, Information Technology and Innovation, Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships, Education Queensland and the CSIRO. Uh, a genomic history of Aboriginal Australia is the first comprehensive genomic study of Aboriginal people uh, in Australia. And this research is another remarkable publication from our new research centre, the uh, Research Centre for Hu of Human Evolution. And that was officially launched uh, this year in July. Um, and this centre has uh, remarkable output already. Uh, in this year we've published, there's uh, seven papers that have been published in the journal Nature and there's already over two million dollars in um, Australian Research Council grants. Um, the publication that we'll be talking about tonight or discussing tonight, we'll hear from the panel, uh, has received enormous uh, amount of interest from across the globe, um, from the popular media, for example the New York Times, uh, the Daily Mail in the UK, and part of, so, uh, part of the reason for this, this interest is not only just the impact of the scientific research, but also the impact that it, on societal change, in particular for um, um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Now, we at Griffith University have a, a very strong commitment to our First Nations people. Um, Griffith University is the university with the highest number of um, First Nations people graduates. Uh, and just to give you an example of the impact that we've had around here, we have in our School of Engineering the largest number of Indigenous students in an engineering uh, school in the country. We have 22 Indigenous students and, are, and it's an amazing number of uh, 17 of those are women. Uh, and this is remarkable in the sense of if you usually know what the ratio of male to female in engineering departments, which tends to be quite low, uh, this is a remarkable number in that way. Now, how has this come about? Well, it, it isn't any, uh, any small feat. And it's come about because of the partnerships that we've formed with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, working closely and sharing the impact of our research in science and engineering and IT with our communities is a driving force behind our impact events. Um, we started the Impact Lecture Series three years ago with the goal of engaging the public um, with the diversity of science, engineering, technology endeavours that we undertake in Griffith University and in particular uh, in um, Griffith Sciences. Um, over the years, we've had discussions and presentations over a really broad range um, of, of science and technology. Um, last month, there was a discussion on how, how Australia can successfully uh, pivot to a knowledge-based economy uh, through a variety of, of, uh, of different means. Um, we've had topics like uh, 3D printing and the effect that that will have on industry, securing Australia's food and water systems, 
meeting the challenges of climate change uh, and sports engineering with our industrial partner, Jaybird Technology. Uh, for those of you that don't know Jaybird Technology, they're looking at the wireless technology for sports, uh, earphones, uh, and that uh, company was just sold off for, uh, for $94 million. The CEO of that company is um, a Griffith graduate. Um, so impact events are held every, every second month at, uh, in Brisbane. Um, and I welcome, I, I welcome you to join us um, as we discuss some of the challenges that, that face our society, um, some of the wicked problems, um, how science and engineering and information technology uh, provides innovation solutions around uh, these, these challenges. Now, in case you're using the technology uh, and you use Twitter, please follow us on Griffith Sciences and use the hashtag uh, GUImpact, one word, that is. If you've got any questions about or comments about this evening, uh, please use that. Uh, we're also live streaming on YouTube and uh, this will be available on our Impact website. There would, you would have seen this uh, being flashed through on the, on the board above us. Now, without further ado, we'll get on to the real stuff. I'd like to hand over to Professor John Olley who will lead us through tonight's discussion. John. So I'm Professor John Olley, I'm Professor of Water Science at Griffith University and it's my pleasure to be MC for you tonight. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Colleen for your acknowledgement to country. Thank you very much for that. I too would like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose land we are meeting and pay my respects to elders past and present. Thank you for taking the time to come and hear about this important research tonight. The uh, format of the evening is quite simple. What we're going to do is we're going to have a presentation from each of the three panel members, David Lambert, Michael Westaway, and Colin Wall. Uh, and then following that, there'll be 30 minutes of open discussion in which you'll be invited to ask them questions. At the end of that 30 minutes, we'll bring the formalities to a close, and you'll be invited to join us for drinks and canapes out on the deck. And there you'll have the opportunity to meet with some of the other authors who are present in the room. Joe Wright, can you stand up? Shankar, can you stand up as well, please? So these are two other authors uh, on the paper who won't be speaking tonight. But you'll have the opportunity to interact with them out on the deck later on. So I'd now, now like to introduce to you our fir the first of our panel members who's going to speak, Professor David Lambert, who's one of the communicating authors on the paper. Now David is the inaugural professor of evolutionary biology at Griffith University. He's a former distinguished professor at Massey University in New Zealand, a principal investigator at the Alan Wil Wilson Center for Mo Molecular Biology and Ecology and Evolution, and a former James Cook Fellow. He's published more than 220 papers, and I will say, all in high quality journals. So one of the things about the way David approaches his work is that he, th there's no pulp in it. He always works through to make sure that he's aiming for the top. And this piece of work that they're going to be talking about tonight is a fine example of that. David's research group, uh, has focused on a wide range of aspects of uh, evolutionary theory and evolutionary genetics. The group has published extensively in these areas, particularly in relation to species theory, the nature of Darwinian biology, and ancient DNA. And I'd now like to invite David to the floor to speak to you about the research on Aboriginal genomics. David, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks John. That's very kind. Uh, I pay him a lot of money to say nice things like that. Um, okay, so now I've just got to work out how to use this. Okay, so um, yeah, I think that's the first slide. So um, uh, this is an um, uh, informal kind of talk, so if you want to shout at me, you're entitled to do that at any point. Um, so this is the uh, Griffith University team that uh, are authors on the paper. Um, Michael Westway, who you're going to hear from, uh, Shankar Subramanian and Joe Wright uh, from my group, uh, Tim Hoopink, who is a member of the group who's, uh, who's uh, gone back to Europe, uh, unfortunately, and uh, myself. So um, just uh, a little bit, um, the, the thing I have to say right at the beginning 
there's that. I think, you know, the, the science uh, output here is phenomenally important, I think. Um, you know, there really are some findings here that um, uh, we, major findings, I think, about um, the uh, settlement of this continent um, and how uh, uh, the Aboriginal Australian people uh, have played such a major role in worldwide uh, migration patterns uh, and their extraordinary long connection uh, with this land on which we meet now. Uh, so I think it, uh, I would never want to uh, underplay uh, the importance of the findings. I, I would say that, of course. Uh, but but the import, there's, an, there's, uh, there's something that's even more important. And I think the more important bit um, is that we have uh, these nine uh, Aboriginal elders who are authors on the paper. And I think that's so monumentally important uh, because the, the way that research uh, about the settlement of this continent and things has been done, it's usually been done by old white blokes like me uh, and people who study Aboriginal people and that really is a bit of a tragedy, uh, I think. Uh, we have to move to the next stage where we have initially at least as I think we've done in this work, had a, a partnership with Indigenous people, a true partnership and Michael Westaway will talk a little bit about uh, the origins of this project and how it was actually uh, uh, initiated by Aboriginal people. Uh, but what we've got to do, I think, is move to the next phase where we break down this dichotomy between old blokes like me and uh, Aboriginal people. We have to have a new generation of uh, Aboriginal people who uh, do this kind of work. And of course, the longer term hope and dream is that we'll have uh, a generation of Aboriginal uh, students who will come along and become research leaders of their own, uh, in their own right. And uh, we, we, we mustn't stop until we actually achieve that goal. And this is, I think, just the first step. I, I say, when I, and I slightly grit my teeth when I say it, that I'm expecting that uh, our competitors in this field will now, all of a sudden, mysteriously, uh, have a whole lot of Aboriginal uh, elders uh, as authors on their papers. And uh, if they do that, notwithstanding that I'm gritting my teeth, uh, I think that's a terrific thing. That's a really important thing. We will have achieved what we wanted to achieve if that's the case. So here are our, our, our nine elders, and of which uh, Colleen, of course, is one. Very important step. So um, we have international collaborators. There are 1,001 authors on the paper. Not, not exactly. That's a bit of an exaggeration. But only my, I think we, I, I don't think anybody's, and no, I asked this in my research group this afternoon, nobody's bothered to count them up. But we think it's probably something of the order of 70 or so. Uh, our collaboration with Esker Villaslev, who's Prince Philip Professor at Cambridge uh, now, and is also has, uh, uh, still works out of uh, the University of Copenhagen, is a long-term collaborator of ours. Uh, he's a terrific collaborator, and we're very uh, fortunate to work with him, and we hope to do that for many years to come. Uh, these other uh, people were really important key people um, in the development of, particularly of the analyses, and there are some very uh, complex analyses, of course, of such a large volume uh, of genomic data. Uh, Oh, it had a little cadenza, that, anyway. I think that's a, a Mac to P PC uh, thing, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So this is the cover, as, uh, um, as Robert Sang said, you know, it was published a couple of weeks ago online. It's about to be published uh, October 13 in hard copy form. And the, the cover relates to, you see in the middle, uh, early human expansions reveal 787 new uh, human <coughs> genomes. Uh, and that's a combination of three papers that were published in the one uh, issue, uh, uh, as I say, online. So this is, I wanted to do this just very quickly. And, um, uh, you know, it's always hard academics start talking about their work and you need a shepherd's crook to get them off the stage. So, uh, and I have a bit of a reputation as somebody who can never uh, actually keep to time. So uh, Michael is chomping at the bit there, so I have to do my best. Uh, 
Uh, so I'll try and be brief, even though there's a few words here. I wanted to say this, you know, why do this work? Um, many of you will know, the first point up there just says that many of you will know that genomic studies have, of course, um, uh, played a major role in our understanding of out of Africa, uh, ideas about Af out of Africa, and people sort of know that. But the second bullet, or the, maybe the third one, says that um, much of our understanding of the settlement of Australia, however, hasn't been based on genomics. It's been based on archaeology, and uh, you know, some of my best friends are archaeologists, as they say, uh, including Michael. Um, you know, but, so I'm not being I'm not being mean, but that's a fact. And, and the reason is that there was, uh, until we published this paper, there was really one Aboriginal genome known. Uh, was from, a, 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 and we were a part of the group that published that in 2011. There, there are two technically, there'll be somebody in the audience who's sort of technically into this stuff, and there are two other genomes, but they're not from known locations, and, and the data is slightly spurious. So really there was one. And of course, um, so to create this new level of understanding uh, in Australia, we have to have a genomic database to allow genomic people to talk to archaeologists, and I think that was really important. Um, and we did, this is just to uh, say that we did it properly. Uh, this sort of work is, is really important to do properly. Um, we had a um, very good uh, relationship with the Griffith University Ethics Committee. Um, and we sequence these 83 uh, Aboriginal uh, genomes to a high level of coverage and 25 Papuans as well. Uh, just a technical little thing. We, we've done it all with saliva samples, so this is effectively, I just say it's like spitting in a cup. Uh, if you uh, collect a, a saliva sample with these, uh, these uh, you can recover very good genomic uh, uh, sequences from saliva, and that's just because you have a whole lot of uh, uh, your cells in your saliva. Mm, it's not the best in the world. Um, the work that we're going to do from here, we think we, with the, uh, if we can have the, if the ethics committee will approve it, we'd like to move to blood samples, because one of the things that happens with saliva Saliva, you, you'll be sad to know. As you all get older, the amount of bacteria and viruses in your saliva increases quite a lot. And uh, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, older Aboriginal people have given us samples, that meant that we ended up uh, sequencing a lot of bacteria and viruses and having to throw it out and all that. But anyway, uh, but that's how we did it. Um, these are just, this is just to, to show you where the samples came from. Uh, and this is just a ballpark thing to show you we worked hard. Uh, we had these 10 sites across a continental Australia and uh, a number of sites in a highland in Papua New Guinea. Um, and as you can see, the sites go everywhere from Cape York uh, to the central desert and the west uh, and uh, down to places like Mildura in the south. So we, we did a lot of work um, collecting those. And that's, of course, where the Aboriginal elders were so fundamentally important for us because they uh, helped us to uh, talk to people about the work and to help, they will, as the projects go on, and this is the first, we hope, of a very long series, uh, they will be fundamentally involved in helping us to explain to people uh, what came out of the work and what we think is really important, um, and uh, just generally to dialogue with people. Uh, so recent genomic studies have shown that both Aboriginal Australians and Papuans are, are admixed uh, many of you will know this, that as people moved out of Africa, we admixed uh, with uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan people. Um, these are two archaic hominid groups. Uh, there's been a lot of dispute about whether Neanderthals and Denisovans are separate species or different versions of the one Neanderthal group. Uh, and uh, we provide evidence for, the, uh, for a primary Neanderthal uh, admixture of event which gave rise to about 2.3% uh, of the genome which took place in these, uh, a, a, the ancestral populations of all non-Africans and many of you may know that. Uh, but we observed that the ancestors uh, of uh, Aboriginal Australian people and Papuans share uh, about that 2.3% 2, 2 uh, admixture pulse. 
This is just a little summary, and I'll come back to this each time just to refresh your memory. So this is a summary of some of the major dates and findings uh, of the paper itself. Um, uh, so, for example, the hearts there, I think it's kind of cute, the hearts represent admixture between different, uh, uh, different <laughs> archaic groups. Uh, the red hearts uh, mean admixture with Neanderthals, uh, and the blue hearts mean admixture with Denisovan people. Um, and so one of the things that you see there quite clearly is that at a, our estimate is that about 43,000 years ago, there was an admixture event between the lineage of people that came down through Southeast Asia and eventually split into Papuan people and Aboriginal Australians. Uh, as I say, about 43,000 years ago, there was uh, an admixture event between those, that lineage of people and the Denisovan people. Um, and I'll just come, as I say, I'll come back to it each time so that you can digest this as we go. So in relation to the, the Denisovan people, which is this other archaic uh, group of hominids, um, uh, Aboriginal and Papuans uh, appear to contain that admixture. And our best estimates of that is that it's quite high. It's about 4% of, of both Papuan and uh, Aboriginal Australian genomes. Uh, one of the things that we did in the analysis is you constrain the Denisovan admixture in your models when you're trying to understand this. If you constrain it as having occurred before Aboriginal Australian and Papuan people diverged, and I'll talk more about the divergence in a minute, our results then suggest that the admixture, as I said, was about 4%. And there are other statistical methods that we used in the paper. The calculation of these D statistics, which is uh, a, a complete completely different method, which gave us a very similar result of about 5%. So an analysis further suggested that Denisovan and Papuan admixture uh, took place, as I said, about 43,000 uh, years ago. Um, and that date, by the way, overlaps with another recently published study of, of dates, so we're, 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 we're kind of confident of that. And there it is again, 43,000 years uh, admixture event somewhere. And I, I, you know, I, I mean, we have the blue heart there, but we don't know. It's always important, I think, to acknowledge what we know and what we don't know. We don't know where that occurred. We know, I think we know the time. Um, having said that, I haven't bored you with the confidence intervals on a whole lot of these, because they're big. Uh, but that's our best estimate of it. But we don't know where in the globe that happened. Okay, so the major findings, we found that Aboriginal Australians, Papuans, are really mostly the result of a single wave out of Africa. There's been a lot of dispute uh, in the literature in recent times about whether there was one out of Africa event or two out of Africa events. From our data, uh, we could find substantial evidence for the one. That is, the vast majority of the genetic makeup of Aboriginal Australians comes from the same uh, uh, original African lineage as other non-African people uh, around the globe. But the Australian ancestors left this group of immigrants uh, are very early on. One of the most interesting things about the whole settlement uh, of uh, people across the globe was that after the emergence of people out of Africa, um, the ancestors of European and Asian people basically stayed around the Levant or the Middle East as we would call it generally, uh, whereas the ancestors of Papuans and Australian people uh, left quite early and started to move uh, down to this part of the world. And of course one of the really amazing things is that they made it so fast. Uh, they made it right down here and all our numbers, big confidence intervals and everything, uh, it's very clear that they got here re quite quickly indeed. Okay, so Aboriginal and Papuans uh, are split from the ancestors of Europeans and Asian people. Our best estimate of that from the study is 58,000 years ago. Uh, and Aboriginal uh, Australians and Papuans are, of course, very closely related to each other. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the general point here for many people is that these two groups of people are close kin. They're more similar to each other than they are to any other human group anywhere. 
Um, and this is just a principal component analysis that just shows that, just in case you didn't believe me. Um, so if you look at the code there, the blue, it probably has a point, but who cares? Um, the, the, the blue circles here are Australians. Uh, you can see the New Guinea Highlanders uh, here are, are in the red. And we've got European people up in the top left, people from India, uh, the green triangles, and the little blue, blue diamonds are from people from East Asia. That's pretty clear. Uh, Aboriginal uh, 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 Papuans and Aboriginal Australians, by our best estimate, uh, separated from each other 37,000 years ago. Again, big confidence intervals, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, th this is uh, very shocking to the team. Uh, there was a great deal of soul searching and a reanalysis of the data and reanalysis of the data and reanalysis of the data. Uh, but it's very clear that that's, that's our best estimate. And the reason for that is, of course, that um, if you'd asked people beforehand, they would have said, well, Papuan people and Aboriginal people separated at the time that Torres Strait formed. And that, on the face of it, is an extremely sensible thing to say. Uh, but the numbers uh, are, are much deeper in time than that. Um, uh, and, and here it is again. So there's our 37,000 years up there, separation of Papuan people uh, and uh, Aboriginal Australians. Uh, more findings. Subsequently, the ancestral population uh, in Australia differentiated uh, about 31,000 years ago. So we find in the data evidence for a differentiation of, of people. And I, 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 I think I missed one of the really fundamental things I should have said right in the beginning, which is that all of the people that we've looked at in the study are Parmanuan speaking Aboriginal people. So the, there's a major gulf uh, in, in speak, Aboriginal uh, speaking people in this country. Uh, uh, the Parmanuan speakers occupy about 90% of the continent, and the remaining 10% uh, is a very complex and diverse group of people uh, whose language goes by the completely annoying and nonsensical name of non parmanuan speaking people, which I just think is a tragedy. Somebody's got to give you know, a proper name to this, but anyway. Um, and so all of the people we looked at are Parmanuan people. So really, when I say that you know, the results are here that Aboriginal Australian people, every one of you would have your right to put up your hand and say, well, no, Dave, that's not exactly right. Of course, it's Parmanuan speaking Aboriginal people because they're the ones that we looked at. So I think that's really important. Um, but we found evidence of this differentiation of populations about 31,000. I was brave enough there to show you what the intervals are, you know, 10,000 to 32. And the diversification of this corresponds actually um, to the formation of the central desert in Australia, which we think acted as a barrier in some way for this process. So we also inferred a population expansion um, in the Holocene in the past 10,000 years, and we did that uh, for what people who are interested in this thing. We have skyline plot data from the genetic diversity of these people. Uh, and this was associated with limited gene flow from this region uh, to the rest of Australia. And strikingly, this is consistent with, I, I'm just saying it's consistent with, I'm not actually saying it's causal, but it's consistent with the spread of these Parmanuan languages. And, and we know uh, a bit about that, I think, with some confidence. One of the major findings, I think, of the study, um, and this was, you know, for me, this was just completely out of the blue. And, that, by the way, doesn't mean anything. It just means I didn't know anything about the, the, this bit of the, the study. Uh, but w what you see there is a comparison of the, uh, the phylogenetic uh, relationships between the Parmanuan languages, of which there are many, uh, which you see on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side is the uh, phylogenetic relationships of the genomes of those same people who speak those languages, right? And those two trees, and if we gave you, you know, five minutes to really digest it, you, you'd agree with us that there's a, an extraordinary amount of concordance between them. So what I think at a hand-waving level this means is that languages and genomes evolve together in concert in some kind of way. And I think that was really important. And of course, 
one of the things that we're desperate to do now and every night you know we get down on our hands and knees and pray to the ARC God you know that they might that they might give us uh, a, a grant to look at non Pamanuan speaking people because this is a major a major kind of hole in in what we've been trying to do um, so one of the and one of the things that came out of, of the data too, which is really important, I think, and Dashenka Subramanian in, in in the audience here was really the first person to kind of see this in the data, and it's a, one of the really important results, which is that Aboriginal people um, in the, the uh, southwest and the northeast uh, differ from each other rather strikingly, and the bottom bullet is really important. I, I, I think it's 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 phenomenal that that more genetically different than Native Americans are, are from Siberian people in Asia. So people on two different continents, you know, the people, Aboriginal people in the East and the West have more than that level of difference. So that's, that, you know, this is the kind of paper, honestly, that any one of these findings, I think, would make it, you, you know, something very substantial and important. And that's just yet another one uh, of them. Uh, and I'll just finish uh, um, and hand over to Michael. Uh, this is Aubrey Lynch, uh, a Wangatha uh, traditional elder, who was one, also one of the authors on the paper who said this. The result from this study confirm our beliefs that we have uh, ancient connections to our land and have been here far longer than anyone else. It shows something of the depth and extent of, of our kinship connections uh, across our land. And I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of the elders uh, and a lot of Aboriginal people you know, would, uh, would feel that very strongly and uh, we, we agree with them. We think that's exactly right. Uh, so that's uh, me and I think Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm um, hand over to our chairperson, or I'll get him. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, welcome Michael West away to the floor. Michael is a paleoanthropologist and a senior research fellow in the, the newly formed Australian Research Centre for Human Evolution. His interests are largely focused around the intersection between biology and archaeology. His current research program includes research on the human origins in the Sunda and Sahul, the early colonization of Australia, and the human environmental interactions in the past. He currently has excavation programs uh, underway within the Willandra, World, uh, Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area and has an extensive field program underway in the Cape, uh, Cape York area. One of the important things about Michael is that he undertakes his research in collaboration with the Aboriginal communities in those areas. He's one of the few university-based biological anthropologists still undertaking human remains related research with, I with indigenous communities in Australia. Michael, I'd like to welcome you to the floor now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yep, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, right. Is that? No, that's directly after Dave, so that's not yeah, my one. Yeah, that's not the correct one. Sorry. Thanks. And that's it. Yep, great. Uh, yes, and I should mention, first of all, that this study uh, really started for us about four years ago when we were asked by um, members of the Tanaquit community, which are, are a group that live close to Mapoon and Weeper. They invited us to come and, uh, well, they asked for our assistance with a rescue excavation of some human remains that were eroding into the ocean. Um, and it was just prior to the, the wet season breaking, and we were excavating the remains with the community to rebury them further back, and they asked, you know, can you do that sort of stuff they do on CSI? You know, can you? I said, well, we can, but it will take probably more than a day or a night. And um, it's taken about four years, actually, since, since that time. But Thomas Wales, who was in one of the very first slides, uh, was quite seminal in, in, in encouraging us to become involved in this research. And um, from the outset, really, it's been a project that's been initiated by Aboriginal people with their interest in, in learning about their past. And, and Thomas speaks very articulately about the... Um, uh, the significance of the work, and it's unfortunately he couldn't be here, but um, uh, it's, I think it's quite important that you know, this research has really been generated by that close collaboration with traditional owners and, and this deep interest they have in their past. 
Um, I, I was going to talk generally about how the uh, genomic data has, has fit, fitted into our current understanding of archaeological models. And I also will include some paleoenvironmental information to give you an idea of what Australia looked at at different times that links in with the genomic story that Dave has been telling us. Um, you saw this map earlier on. What we, what we do know from the fossil record is uh, that uh, the ancestors of more, all modern humans um, appear to be uh, in East Africa. And this is the fossil of Herto. Uh, the Herto fossil was uh, dated to 160,000 years ago. There are earlier modern humans at around 190,000 years ago um, from Ethiopia also. But that's the, the first actual evidence of modern humans that we see anywhere in the world appearing in East Africa. Um, now, they, they actually seem to uh, leave Africa. Uh, the fossil record indicates around 100,000 years ago. Our genomic data is suggesting uh, a date prior to 72,000 years. This is the, uh, the school five uh, fossil, um, the first modern humans found outside of Africa, actually dated by Rainer Grun, who is uh, the director of our research center. Rainer, importantly with Chris Stringer, dated the school and Kafse fossils, and it was very significant work. Then, then we um, see Dave mentioned the, uh, the uh, admixture event, represented by the little uh, love hearts, um, in the, the Near Eastern area. And, uh, we know that Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens uh, coexisted for a considerable amount of time in that region. And there is clear evidence of uh, genetic admixture between the two groups. So every Homo sapiens living outside of Africa carries a signature of this ancient admixture event. The uh, exciting thing is uh, that we also see um, evidence in the first Australians and also people from Papua New Guinea of, a, of an additional admixture event with this mysterious population known as the Denisovans. When the Denisovan fossils were originally found, when I say fossils it was actually a, a, a finger bone, um, not many uh, fragments at all other than some tiny bits of post crania. And when they analysed the DNA they were expecting to see a genomic signature of Neanderthals, but the, the signature was entirely different. So there are a lot of examples of Neanderthal DNA and, and the Denisovans are a species now recognised from DNA alone. We don't have fossils of them. Well, we have fossils, but they haven't been able to reveal DNA. The Namada fossil from, um, uh, from India, central India, dates to uh, the middle Pleistocene, and it has been suggested as a possible contender for um, the Denisovans, but really we have no clear understanding of what the anatomy, the morphology of these individuals look like. Uh, so, uh, and in, in Australia, of course, we, the earliest fossil evidence we have of people is around 42,000 years. And John Ali, who's the chair, actually played a, uh, a very uh, pivotal role in dating the remains of Mungo Man by dating uh, the, the sediment, the, the ochre infill that he was buried with. So, um, uh, Reiner has also played a role in dating these remains too. So, uh, this is the story that we, that we recover from the fossil record. Um, and it, uh, closely matches the story that we're, we've been telling from the genomic uh, record, what we re re recount in the genomic record from this paper. Uh, Dave has already mentioned this very fascinating divergence that seems to occur some 37,000 years ago between the Papuan people and the first Australians. Uh, this is what Australia looked like um, at this time. For uh, the 50,000 years that we know that Aboriginal people have been here, 40,000 years of that time, Australia was, uh, Greater Australia was connected to, to Papua New Guinea and uh, Tasmania in a landmass that uh, biogeographers called Sahul. So um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that this divergence happens long before the drowning um, of the, the, the plains between Papua and Northern Australia. Uh, and that may relate to the size of the populations at the time. I mean, there are a whole range of, uh, I think, important research questions that now need to be investigated to try and understand the, the, the reasons behind this very early divergence. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, an interesting example of a, a divergence without the creation of a geographic barrier. But, um, as Dave mentioned, and Shankar was the person in our research group, in the broader research group, that actually first identified this, the uh, divergence between um, Aboriginal populations, we see the, start, the starting, the first evidence of population structure is this split between the East and the West. And uh, archaeologists like Peter Veth from the University of Western Australia has for many years, this is his uh, barriers and boundary model, identified the expansion of the deserts at this time, um, perhaps played a key role in the reduction of gene flow between populations in the East and West. And, 
And certainly that picture now seems to be emerging from the genomic data too. So uh, this, it's a uh, very interesting insight into um, the initial formation of population structure in Aboriginal Australia during the Pleistocene. Uh, Dave also mentioned that there is evidence for uh, population change in the, in the, or around 10,000 years ago. Now archaeologists for years have argued that there is a significant shift in the archaeological record suggesting that Aboriginal people started to intensify their subsistence strategies, become more um, sedentary, um, and this resulted in dramatic increases in populations. Uh, many archaeologists dispute this. The archaeological record is a terribly biased thing. The earlier record is often eradicated by erosional processes, so there's this extreme taphonomic bias, this bias towards preservation of later sites at the cost of the earlier sites. Um, uh, some archaeologists, like Peter Bellwood from the Australian National University, suggested perhaps the Pamanuan people uh, have an external origin, and we see uh, this arrow between Sulawesi and uh, the uh, southeast part of Cape, uh, the Gulf of Carpentaria, which is the area where the Pamanuan languages are generally accepted to uh, disperse from. Uh, Billwood has suggested, well, the dingoes arrive in Australia around three and a half thousand years ago. There are new stone tools. Perhaps there's an external influence. Um, there is no evidence whatsoever in the genomic data for an, uh, uh, a migration uh, from, uh, from Sulawesi or any other part of, of the continent uh, overseas. There is, um, has been also suggestions that, that there was a major influx of genomes from India in the late Holocene. But again, there's no evidence for this in the paper. So uh, it's, it's quite an extraordinary story that the people that arrived here some 50,000 years ago remain in, largely in isolation, and it's continuous right up into the time of European colonisation. There is some limited gene flow between Papua New Guinea and Cape York. Uh, there's evidence for that in the paper, but by and large, the population that first arrives here 50,000 years ago is continuous, and that's why quite often you'll hear the first Australians referred to as, as the longest continuous culture. Um, so, uh, and Dave has also mentioned um, a very exciting uh, element of the paper is the, um, the, the, the pairing of the genomic signature with the, um, the linguistic data. And we have this suggestion, and uh, Dave mentioned briefly, the skyline plots indicate that the population increase is actually 10,000 years ago. So much earlier than archaeologists have been arguing. Um, I think it's a key thing now uh, for archaeologists and uh, uh, people working with molecular biology to start to work closer together to understand what the actual mechanisms for this population change may have been. But it also seems to be associated with the dispersal of these languages. And uh, Dave mentioned that the two things seem to overlap. Uh, understanding the actual mechanism, I think, is uh, probably requires a lot more research now. Um, this is what Australia looked at around that time, 10,000 years ago, still connected to Papua New Guinea. Uh, Lake Carpentaria is now open to the Arafura Sea, but around 8,000 years ago, there's a separation between those two places. So uh, the, I think one of the really exciting aspects of this paper is that it, it did look very carefully at the record from the, the fossil record and also worked very closely with archaeologists and biological anthropologists to try to tell the story from a multidisciplinary um, perspective. Uh, it, it, this paper also comes at an important time, and we had Dawn Casey at the launch, at the media launch, uh, who was the former director of the National Museum, and is also involved in the uh, consultative committee discussing the, um, the, uh, the recognition of the first Australians in the Australian Constitution, and that will probably be a referendum next year. Um, one of the um, senators uh, in the um, uh, Australian Senate um, has suggested that there had, may have been people in Australia prior to the Aborigines. If there was any doubt at all, why would we put that history into the Constitution? So there have been some strong statements uh, questioning, I think, uh, why would we would put the um, first Australians in the Constitution when there's the possibility that there were other populations in the country. And certainly uh, there was a paper published in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2001, which argued that the DNA of Mungo Man may have been from a, an extinct lineage. Um, uh, Dave and his research group published uh, earlier this year, or we published, uh, findings suggesting that that uh, DNA result was probably the result of contamination, and we couldn't recover ancient DNA from that individual. So um, 
I think it's very clear from this paper, uh, and I think many Aboriginal people picked up on this point, that it supports this idea that there's this long, continuous uh, occupation of the country. There's no evidence that there was a population uh, in Australia prior to the Aboriginal people arriving here. Uh, there's an extraordinary story that shows uh, a unique admixture event with the Denisovans. Um, it provides a very strong statement in support of Aboriginal recognition in the Constitution. I think that's a very important thing uh, for this paper and the research. Um, and really, that's probably enough for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Colleen Wall. Colleen's an, uh, Colleen is an artist and co-author on the paper. She's a se senior Dower woman of the uh, Kobe Nation. Colleen uh, has an enormous amount of experience in working with, uh, on indigenous art projects and also on sensitive repatriation issues. Colleen also has extensive experience in wor working in public administration. Colleen, I would like to welcome you to the floor to talk to us about this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a different tact. I'm going to come from an Aboriginal point of view, as should be. Um, but I do have a white side in my family, and he's German, um, my dad, um, who probably influenced us in our family much more than my mother at the time. Um, I'm sure dad was a um, black gypsy from Germany, or before Germany. Um, so uh, he taught us a lot, um, but what he taught us most about was respecting our Aboriginal life and our Aboriginal ancestors. Um, and we had um, kovai bees in our backyard in a small um, hive all the time we were growing up as children. And we always told, were told that they were our um, ancestral beings um, and belonged to our family. Just recently, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether people know, but I'm the chair of Queensland South Native Title Services too. So I wear strange hats, um, get confused with them sometimes. Um, but we've just been told by Queensland South Native Title Services that our family can't prove that we come from our country with white paperwork. So we're now in the process of trying to um, set in place some paperwork that tells what our family told us as history and the importance of knowing what our history is and where we belong to um, is really um, paramount at this stage. So everything I do now and everything I write is based on proving where we come from, <laughs> just to get up their nose, even though I'm the chairperson there. So <laughs> it's a bit of a strange thing to do. But um, so when I introduced myself before, um, that was an official capacity. Now I have to introduce myself in the proper cultural way um, because I'm speaking about law, about Jukka, um, which is our land law. I acknowledge the ancestors of the Turrbal Yugaval peoples and ask that they, again, that they again validate my being here and working on their land. I am Colleen Murren Wall, a senior woman of the Dawa Kovai Nation of the Mary River Basin, the next major river system north of Brisbane. And I'm very honoured to be involved in this project um, with Dave and Mike. Um, I met Mike a long time ago, and I'm not even sure when, Adelaide or somewhere. <laughs> when we were doing the repatriation process for human remains across Australia and continued to, to keep in contact with Mike around that process. So, and that's basically how I got involved in this project because the people from Birdsville that I was working with at the time on an arts project and um, sustainable desert community research asked me to contact somebody who could do DNA on their remains um, for them through their native title process. So immediately I thought of Mike um, so that's what we did. We're still cop and flack over that, but we'll wear it. Um, so, in the way I paid respect um, in the, the acknowledgement country, I was hoping that I would give you some awareness of Aboriginal connectedness to country. And that was my aim. I believe my bloodline not only comes from my family ancestors, 
but also from our spiritual ancestors of our country. The specific Murrung ancestors that I acknowledge today are in my DNA and therefore in my psyche. It is what I live and what I breathe. Kunavong is the water mother. We call her the mother of all waters, but it's back to front um, in English to Aboriginal language. So we call her water mother. She is one of the elements which we honour with the freshwater dreaming song line that runs through our country. Kunavong's spirit is in the blood which runs through the river veins of our mother's, mother earth. So as water makes up 60% of our adult bodies, we acknowledge that Kunavang's blood runs in our veins. Kunavang ensures the growth of my stringy bark grandmother, whose roots bind me to my specific country. My country's specific rich, fertile soil was formed by the elements of wind and water over many millions of years of erosion, and it nurtures the specific vegetation of our country. Grandmother stringy bark, being part of that vegetation, provides bark with healing properties and for making shelters. Grandmother Kovai B, who provides most other food through pollination of flowers, feeds from grandmother stringy bark. So it's a very important process about living together and collaboration. The pollen Kovai's gather along with her honey is healing medicine for us as well. So Grandmother Murren, the Gwena, lives underground and in the trees like stringy bark. She feeds on what is provided by the land and the water, but is also a scavenger whose job it is to clean up the land. All things under our law, Juka, must collaborate and cohabitate. They've got to work together as they are explicitly, explicitly linked for future survival by water. I know that water is vital to every cell, that every cell in a person's body has the same DNA and that this DNA is hereditary material in humans and my, almost all other organisms. And that's probably all I can quote. <laughs> um, so I put it into the context of our law, Juka, and how, what it looks like for us. We as humans, the smart ones in this land, have a responsibility to main our Duggan Mother Earth, who also relies on corn water. By doing this, we are continuing our hereditary line and therefore maintain our link to country. When we talk of belonging, Carnarvon provides a vital nutrient to the life of every cell acting first as a building material. Water regulates our internal body temperature by sweating and respiration, which provides us with our new, unique smell that allows ancestral beings to recognise where we come from. It is our signature. For protection, our tra traditionally we would anoint strangers to our country with Kunavang's water from sacred water holes. In the absence of our country's sacred water, we use sweat so that they are protected indirectly by the sacred water passed through us. This sweat is our country's smell which all things from that country recognise. As a people, we hug a lot. And people often say, why do you hug everybody? Well, for me, this is a modern transfer of DNA smell. Because in these days, we can't go around wiping sweat on people. <laughs> so hugging has to be the opportunity to do that. Um, and you often go to, a, the worst thing is to go to an Aboriginal conference because everybody has to hug hello and then everybody has to hug a, a goodbye. So sometimes if people get up to leave in the middle of a speech or somebody's presentation, the presentation stops and everybody says goodbye to one another. So you add an extra day on to a conference so you can do this process. But it's law, it's what we have to do. So under survival, all the nutrients, nutrients like carbohydrates and proteins that our body uses for food are metabolised and transported by water in the bloodstream. This is also true for our waterways, as Kunavang's river and veins carry nutrients and minerals to nurture and grow our land. If we block her veins, it is like a blood clot in our veins. What is below the clot will eventually die. Kunavang's water assists the flushing waste, in, flushing waste from our bodies. Lack of water can build up stones in our vital organs, eventually blocking the flow. This also happens in the river systems. 
If we don't get a good flood, the silt and rubbish restricts the flow of water and can stop it altogether. So I talk about working with the Australian Research Centre for Human, and I keep saying resolution, revolution instead of evolution, because I think that fits good. Um, so in regards to the importance of this particular project, I want to say that personally, and I can only give a personal opinion, because if I give a general opinion, somebody will yell at me. Personally, I think the outcome of this research is, is important to all Aboriginal people, even if they don't trust the process or the people working in it. It will still benefit us all through the recognition status of how ancient our connection is with this continent. And I was just list talking, uh, listening while the other guys were talking there, and I thought about a process that I went through about six months ago where I'd gone up to the Sunshine Coast to do some reconciliation talks um, up that way. And we had a speaker talking about um, the history of stories of Aboriginal people and how stories tell us um, that we think, that we know our stories tell us, that we are much older and we've been on this land much, much longer than science proves. Our stories prove that. And I was just watching, looking at the maps, and the map there um, that you showed with the head on it, where there was no gulf and it, and it joined right up. Um, fits in with the Yoro Yoro story from um, Kimberley's. In Yoro Yoro, which means country standing up alive, he talks about, uh, old uncle talks about um, the body of Australia and whereas the shoulders, the Kimberley's are the shoulders and Cairns are the shoulders. Um, Perth and Tasmania are the legs. The bite is the, the, the crotch area. Um, and I could never understand because the part of the gulf um, where Burketown is, in that bottom part of the gulf, is the heart and there's no head. But when I saw it on the map there, I realised that's the head. So that's the finished map that he told the story of um, in his book, Yoro Yoro. So to me, that's really important process about how we use our stories to prove um, that, we're there, that they're, not, they're, they're real stories of history. They're not what we, we call as myths and legends um, now in modern day. There's also, um, we were talking in that conference up there about um, the stories we tell. And this historian was telling us about how ancient Aboriginal people embellished the stories so they were easier to remember. So when we talked about giant white kangaroos, that was a beat up so that our kids could actually remember that story. Because they wouldn't remember a story about a little kangaroo because everybody's got little kangaroos. So let's talk about a big giant white kangaroo because we'll remember it better. So one of the Aboriginal guys got up and said, but what about the, the scientific proof that Aboriginal people had carved um, megafauna? Don't you think that the giant kangaroos in that process, in that story, connected to that um, event in life, that we were there with megafauna? And he said, I hadn't thought about that. That's possible. So he actually came and had to talk to us after, and we had to talk to him, um, to say, well, we think that this is really what happened. Um, and, and it's a lot longer. So we didn't embellish stories. They are the real stories. You guys just have to find the proof that goes with them. <laughs> That's my point anyway. So, um, so getting back to the smell of country, which comes from the specific soil type, which feeds a tailor-made ecology and this ecology feeds the entire nation of people who develops its specific footprint scent. People know their country and can read it like a book and also have an inherent responsibility of all things that live there because they are linked by Kunabang's water. They can tell if the land is sick, when it needs to be burnt, when a specific species needs to be left to grow larger and etc. This research can place us directly to where we come from and this is what I'm excited about in this process. Even though, and this, this talks about Mike's other research as well in the Cape, um, 
Even though we may have been moved by the government systems or through survival mechanisms several generations ago, it will assist us to bring home some of our ancestral human remains to their country by the way of identifying country DNA. Because those old people still in country are waiting for those people to come home. The land will be happy when they come home because they are totemic Murrung ties to that country. So families waiting for that family to come back in those, in those um, human remains. Um, our country knows us. Our family moved from, a before official paper, paper systems were created, but our stories and our feelings and our ancient DNA automatically takes us back to where we belong. That craving to go to a particular spot that you have never been to before, or that urge to look out the window of the car while you are driving to see a marung on the side of the road, is that genetic drive to hone you back home. Every time we drive through country, we see marung belonging to someone in our family. A lizard, a bird, or a tree that's specific to our family. Once we saw two deer, and I was really confused about that, and my son says to me, that's okay, that's our English ancestors saying hello. He's always pragmatic. So responsibility. Our Minicon Lingwadoc Beasley family have the responsibility to kin continue passing on to women as protectors of fresh water, the path of our freshwater dreaming storyline. It runs all over the nation, across Australia and probably across the world. It runs through our lands from west to east and then south over the lands which are now the continental shelf to the lakes of Minjeriba. From Stradbroke Island, it travels west through this land, through this land's low-lying areas of lakes, and now dams such as Manipi, Tengalpa Reservoir, Reservoir, Lake Manchester, Warralong Dam, and onto Halidon Springs and beyond. On its way, it replenishes all the water holes through underground springs created by Kunavang, which are protected by Mondagari, who lives in these water holes and who travels to visit our sky ancestors as Duncan the Rainbow. Finally, I wish to acknowledge the Turrbal Yugrabal peoples with whom I've worked over many years through the arts and cultural events. These families have assisted by working with Queensland Performing Arts Centre to in instigate the resumption of cultural ceremonies on the South Bank precinct. Brisbane is a community of many clans and nations and we now respectfully, under the watchful eye of the local mob, attend the Clan Sestry Festival each year to bring back the gathering of clans to this most important river system. I leave you now with a kovai blessing. Maruba Ninda, may life be good to you. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. I'd now like to invite the panel members uh, to come and take a seat up the front. Sorry, Colleen, you just said, <laughs> can you come back up here, Michael, David and Colleen? And I'd like to uh, open the evening up to questions from the floor. So can you raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over to you and can you state your name and your affiliation uh, and then ask your question? So any questions of any of the panel members? Hi, my name's Tim Page. I'm a former Griffith student and I currently work for the Department of Science. I was wondering, uh, I guess Dave in particular, uh, whether you'd um, integrated any ancient DNA from Aboriginal Australians with the contemporary um, patterns you have here and if it, they added anything new, any um, new lineages or any distinct patterns. Um, yeah, look, thanks, uh, Tim, for the, for the question. I, I didn't pay him to ask this question, but I, I should have. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the, uh, you, you know, there's a, a sort of simple answer and a, a longer, more complex one. Um, the, the thing is we, we, have, um, we have been working on ancient uh, Aboriginal remains, uh, again in partnership with a number of groups. Um, uh, if, uh, if I were to tell you all, all the details, I'd have to kill you. Um, so it's a, I'll speak a little in tongue, but we we have um, 
we have uh, made quite a lot of we have quite a lot of success uh, with um, uh, ancient remains. Uh, um, I have to say this is in a particular context. You know, the context is that um, uh, you know the history of ancient DNA research has been born out of uh, work um, like the other half of, I guess, what my research group does, um, looking at per permafrost material. So we've had a, a program for uh, uh, for some for a decade or more, looking at ancient DNA of uh, Antarctic penguins. Um, you, you know, because that's terrific, you know, that's the easy stuff to do, work on uh, material that's been permanently frozen and, um, you know, I always say the Antarctic's really good, not just because it's the coldest place on earth, but because it's the driest place on earth, so, which most people don't don't uh, don't know. Um, so cold and dry is wonderful. Uh, what's not wonderful is to work on uh, 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 attempts to recover, particularly a whole genome sequences from uh, material that comes from very hot environments. Um, and uh, the older it gets, the harder it gets. So um, we have uh, had quite a reasonable amount of success uh, in very general terms. We have a whole lot of uh, ancient uh, mitochondrial genomes of Aboriginal people and we're working on that material now. Um, and we have had some success with um, sequencing um, uh, complete nuclear genomes of some material. But that's been very long, uh, hard uh, process um, over a period of time. Um, and we're in the process of trying to, uh, to publish that now. But, uh, but uh, uh, Tim, in real answer to your question, that was kind of where we started. We actually started, Michael and I, um, started to work with the Willandra, the Barkindji, the Niampa and the Money Money people um, back in 2009 um, to uh, try and recover ancient material. And Michael spoke uh, briefly about our paper on looking at um, uh, DNA sequences recovered from Mungo Man. So the, the, the project, in its initial uh, uh, guys was actually born out of wanting to do ancient uh, uh, DNA uh, from Aboriginal material and you know I mean it's fair to say that that's uh, enormously I, I always say that my research group you, you know we we're always out there trying to do almost the impossible you know um, you know which is which means that we fail a lot you know, but you, you've got to do that. You have to fail a lot if you're going to do the really hard stuff. You, you, you could do a whole lot of easy things, but where would the fun be in that? Uh, I think you know. so. So uh, Tim, yeah, it was born out of ancient DNA, and um, the, the the modern genomics kind of caught up very quickly and went over the top of it. But we're still working on it, and um, uh, uh, you know, if we're lucky, we'll be doing that for a long time yet. I, I sort of dodged the question a little bit. I'm sorry, Tim, because I'd have to kill you, you know, so I <laughs> won't do that. Oh, don't, don't let him ask a question. <laughs> so uh, Jeremy Brownlee from Griffith University. Uh, I wanted to know from all of the panel, in terms of the data that's been collected, is there anything around the, the pattern of migration across the continent? And what do traditional stories uh, tell us about uh, that, that movement of people across the continent. Could I take a stab at the first bit anyway, and I might hand over to the others about the other. The, the, the data do show from that, dif that pattern of differentiation that started about 31,000 years ago in Cape York, and there does seem to be, at a hand-waving level, you know, some evidence of um, uh, 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 um, a movement out of Cape York down the east coast and across to the west. And that's where, of course, the differentiation between the east and the west kind of populations happened. But with respect to the second half of the question, I, I can't answer that, so I'm going to hope Michael can. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting because many traditional owners have asked similar questions. Um, they've got stories of their origins, and um, there's some very well no one that, known ones that um, Colleen has already mentioned, and also stories from Arnhem Land about ancestral spirits coming across the, the, the seas and, and laying down numerous babies across the north of Australia, which became different clans. But um, in uh, West Cape York, uh, the Tanaquit people and other groups um, from uh, uh, Weeper and Mapoon uh, have stories of an ancestral hero called Shivery, and he migrates up the west coast of Cape York 
ends up in the Torres Strait. Um, and there are lots of families all the way along that story. There are, there are um, features in the landscape that are associated with uh, the wives that he abandons on the way. And there are families that link to these, uh, to these uh, landscape features um, that are living today and, and connect to the story. So th I think there's great potential to start now looking at some of these Aboriginal stories of ancestral migrations and movements and perhaps seeing if that can be borne out in, in the genomic data. I mean, Colleen has already suggested there are, there are stories from the past that have been reflected in, in scientific investigations, but I think there might now be the opportunity to actually start looking at some of these Aboriginal narratives about origins and movements and dispersals and, and seeing if that could potentially be reflected in, in genomes. It's, it's very ambitious, and Dave is probably sort of grinding his teeth as I say this, but um, it's, 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 it, I think it would it's, it'd be a really nice way to see the science go in that direction, to, to develop closer partnerships with these Aboriginal origin stories. Could, could I just make uh, just a PS comment, like uh, at, a, at a very general kind of level, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, I've always been slightly, you know, substantially irritated, you know, by uh, a lot of the arguments that traditional knowledge is very different to scientific knowledge. And, you know, scientists, you have to worry about them, you know, by and large, because they can be enormously arrogant. You know, they think that science is the only kind of knowledge. Um, I find just extraordinary that somebody would argue that. But one of the, uh, and people, so people often say, you know, evolutionary, uh, knowledge about evolutionary things is different to indigenous knowledge. And, and it isn't, it isn't actually, because, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge is about narratives, about, you talked about some of them. Yeah. You know, Michael just did then. It's about a narrative about how the world came to be the way it is. And evolutionary biology is exactly the same. It's narratives about how the world came to be the way. Okay, they use different words and different tools, uh, but nevertheless, substantially, you know, they're very similar. So uh, I think the moral of the story is scientists shouldn't get too arrogant. Mm -hmm. Colleen, did you want to add anything? Yes, some of the stories that we talk about a lot in our family, and um, my son uh, has a direct degree in archaeology, so there's always lots of arguments in our house <laughs> about things that I say. Um, but um, he's now a security guard and ha carries a gun, so I don't argue too much with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's stories there around um, sea level rises, and I know Griffith Uni did. Um, some, I'm sure, I think it was Griffith Uni. One of the unis did some research around the dust between um, Birdsville and uh, that, where, where that dust goes yep. in the dust storms. Um, and I, at one of the big dust storms, um, they, they found uh, dust from Birdsville in um, New Zealand in the snow. Um, but they did a big uh, research project in um, Stratty, in, in the, the uh, lakes at Stratty. And they showed us this pile of data and a couple of friends and I were sitting in this um, workshop at uh, the museum, Queensland Museum. And they showed a whole pile of data and there was in, in the data there was this whole, a whole uh, stack of coal, charcoal, in the, in the um, research that they'd done when they, when they did the uh, dig into the lake. Um, and I said to one of the guys, do you think it's possible that that, that charcoal um, was there was caused by when everybody moved up from when the, the water rose. I said, because blackfellas aren't dumb, they'll carry the wood with them and they'll store wood. So, and, and they'll store wood to the highest point um, so that when the water rises, they'll still have um, something to cook with or something to build with. Um, so they actually acknowledged that, yes, it could be, but their research wasn't about that. It was about the dust. So. In our minds, we, we locked that away so that there was proof there that there was a lot of people who moved up. Um, and when we talk about the different languages, in our, in our, and Uncle Bob and I talk about this a lot, um, that Nyugi, Uncle Bob's mob, live on Morton Island in a very small space. Same with Butchler, they live in a little <coughs> small space. So when the water came up, everybody had to move so those people could move in and share country. So in that process, we shared stories and responsibility in the country because if they're living on our country, they actually have to be responsible. So there's stories that talk about that sea level rise and stories um, and the language, difference in the language is very clear that a lot of those little 
spots of different languages up and down the coast are those people who moved from out there. And we're all waiting now, so when the water goes back out, and we can have some of our land back, but they can also recreate their stuff back on their land. So some of those stories that are out there, like our freshwater dreaming story, goes east of Noosa, and then down, um, and then back into study. So we know in our own mind that our people knew that country, um, and when we fly over, we look at it, and we know every time we see a map that shows there where the, the land was, we still talk about that. And, and the guys in um, Girigan and up through that way, they still talk about the, the stories up there where their sites are out there on the country. And I think um, Dale Kerwin, when he was doing his doctorate, um, he was researching uh, all around Australia. And they found this, the, this green stone that they were using in, um, like it's like church, mm -hmm. and they're using it for fine blades. Um, and they, there was nowhere in Australia where that was found. But uh, Aboriginal people said, no, it was ours. And when they were doing oil drilling out on the, the um, continental shelf out from Perth, they actually found the, the green rock there that was the same as these churches within the museum. So the stories are true as far as we're concerned, and they're really important to us. Um, and which is one of the reasons why I'm working with these guys, so one of these days we'll get this done. But um, it's, just, it's just about, you know, if it's a big ship, you've got to turn it around sometimes. <laughs> and, and so are the, the grant funding people. So it's about how we can do that. And I think one of the things that we're talking about at the moment around story base um, within Queensland South Native Title Service, well, Native Title Services across Australia, is what we do with all the data that comes out of all the research we do. Because like the universities, there's this, you know, Chinese walls and whatever around research. Um, so a lot of that stuff, because it's um, collected by lawyers and put into court cases, it's um, secret, sacred stuff. Um, so we're now negotiating how we can actually bring some of that back and put that back in the ownership of the traditional owners once they get native title to use that research as a collective to assist them to go forward in that research. So it's otherwise it's millions and millions of dollars that we've used in research that just sits in a box. So we want to um, make that a, a better process so that Aboriginal people can get their stories back out there and then we do have a wider range of stories across Australia within that native title sector um, that they can use. Uh, further questions? Oh, you're right. Yeah, come on at the back. Okay. Got one on Twitter. Why, why is Twitter. it always at the back? <laughs> 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 right, Andrew Brooks from Griffith Uni. Um, the, uh, the chronology from the, uh, the genomic evidence is uh, substantially younger than the, the archaeological dates. And I noticed that Michael's still sticking to the uh, the, the older uh, archaeological ep the timing. Would you care to comment on the disparity between the, the genomic evidence and the archaeological dated evidence? With, uh, sorry, mate, I, I didn't really quite understand. With respect to which bit? The, the, the dates of the first arrivals are around 37. Yeah, um, the 30, yeah, 37 is the time of divergence of Papuan people. Oh, I got that, okay, yeah. Um, there's, um, we, we spend a lot of time as a group, you know, talking about this because, um, you know, the, uh, the simple answer to it is the point that I made earlier on about the big confidence intervals, you know, because, um, you know, you would always expect that, um, uh, you know, date of divergence of 37,000 of Papuan people and uh, Aboriginal people, you would always have expected uh, that it was going to be, uh, you know, substantially uh, are different to that because, of course, we know that people have been on this continent for 50,000 years, probably at least uh, of the order of 43. We know. Um, so, uh, so, but I think when you look actually, uh, we have, funny enough, we had a conversation about it in the research group today that when you look at the confidence intervals on all of those, they all pretty much sort of overlap. So we're sticking to our story that if you look at the confidence intervals, you know, there's not very much in it. On the face of it, I understand why you would say that. 
and some people have said that in response to the, the paper too. There have been some articles written, some of them by our competitors, um, you know, saying, well, the, you know, these guys clearly did something wrong because those dates don't quite match. But I think it's because we, we presented, as we did here, the best estimate, but the confidence intervals are pretty big. Hi. Janet Wong from Darwin. I'm here as an interested citizen and a proud Aussie, proud Territorian, and a former molecular geneticist. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate all authors on this um, exciting research. I think it's a very, very important um, research and a very important piece of Australian story. So congratulations to all of this. And um, I also would like to thank you uh, to Elder Colleen uh, for uh, your welcome to country. It's the first proper welcome to country that I had since 18 months being in Brisbane, so that's a bit sad in that um, I would have liked it at um, arriving at the airport or from the airlines uh, speakers or something, but that's another conversation we could have. We're working um, on that one. <laughs> so, uh, as a proud Territorian, my question would be, um, and I think the non Pema Nguyen yep. um, Aboriginal people are in the, mostly in the territory, so yes. when are we going to get those data and when are we engaging those <laughs> Aboriginal Australians? My case. Yep. Well, that's um, the, you know that's a good that's the, one of the next steps uh, in the in the process for us. That was the the prayer that I made to the ARC gods, uh, you know, because we have a a, a grant, uh, you know, to try and do that. It's being considered at the moment, and hopefully not far off being announced. Uh, but you never promise fish before you go fishing, so we we don't know what's going to happen there. Um, no, it's very important. It, it's a really important thing. Um, we have uh, good collaborations with, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of people. Um, you know, we're, we're due to uh, go to Mornington Island, not far away, and uh, to, uh, you know, there's an agreement that we, we can uh, sample some people there. Um, we're, we're very keen to try and get those um, uh, a, a partnerships established with people in, in the top end because uh, they're, they're, that's a really important component of the puzzle. And if we can solve that one, I think we'll make a, a, another really substantial uh, you know, inroads into this very complex kind of question of the settlement uh, of Australia. And of course that, by the way, is also a part of that plan, that hope and dream that we have to to study uh, non and genomes is also to study uh, genomes, both ancient and modern, uh, of people from South Oceanic Southeast Asia, and particular Sulawesi and Timor and places like Alur Island. And so we're, we, we're, we're working very hard to try and uh, do that kind of work. But uh, thank, thanks very much for the comments. And uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, all I can say is, you know, we're, we're kind of working on that. And, Hopefully. One more question. One more quick one. Um, just from Twitter from uh, at Roundy Round. <laughs> uh, and I'm guessing it's directed at you, Michael. Um, with the archaeo archaeological finds, were there, are there significant sites and sort of what sort of depths are those finds at? Or is it dispersed? Uh, sorry, the question is. For the archaeological digs, is oh. there. Specific specific sites, or is it very distributed across Australia? Uh, no, well, there there are uh, you know probably a handful of sites that date to before thirty thousand years, and so one of the earliest sites have, uh, is called Majibibi in Arnhem Land, which dates to possibly now fifty five thousand years ago. And Chris Clarkson from the University of Queensland has been excavating that site, and uh, that's been a very thorough uh, reinvestigation of that important place. Uh, Lake Mungo, where Dave and I have done a lot of our work, um, the burial of Mungo Man is 42,000 years old, and Mungo Woman is also 42,000 years, and associated beneath the burial of Mungo Man, another metered, but uh, he, below his side are, are stone tools. So um, uh, Jim Bowler, who discovered those ancient people, um, has estimated that the, the chronology of, of those artifacts are around 50,000 years as well, and they've been dated with OSL dating and, and John Olley has been involved in dating some of the, the very ancient remains. So there are another site called Devil's Lair in, in Western Australia is also possibly 50 to 55,000 years ago. So there are a number of sites now that um, 
uh, uh, pushing back the, the antiquity of understanding of Aboriginal occupation. Um, does that answer that tweet, do you think? Sort of <laughs> thank you, Michael. So I'd like to ask you now to thank the panel. And, and just before I hand over to Robert to uh, close the evening for us, I'd ask uh, Joe and Shanka to stand up again, <laughs> just so that people, they may have forgotten what you look like. So these are two other authors on the paper. 